If you ever feel out of control around food, you're not alone, and you're in the right place to learn practical, no-nonsense information about why you binge and how to stop. Binge eating does not mean that something is wrong with you. It's a natural but primitive brain response that you can correct. If you're ready for change, sign up for the Brain Over Binge self-paced online course for less than $20 per month. And if you feel you need personalized support, we also offer one-on-one coaching and group coaching. To learn more, go to brainoverbinge.com forward slash subscribe. And I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Brain Over Binge podcast, where you learn a simple brain-based approach to ending binge eating. I'm Katherine Hansen, and I'm happy to be here to share insights and ideas and information to help you stop binge eating. For those of you who are new here, I'm the author of Brain Over Binge and the Brain Over Binge Recovery Guide, and my mission is to make recovery practical and attainable for anyone who wants to live free of bulimia, binge eating disorder, or any form of -of out-of-control eating. For today's show, and I hope for some future shows as well, I thought it would be helpful to share some real-life situations that I encountered while I was giving up binging and after recovery. I often talk in pretty general terms on this show when it comes to eating because everyone is so different as far as how they choose to eat, and I never want people to think that they need to eat in the same way that I'm eating. And another reason that I usually talk in a more generalized way is that conversations about specific foods or ways of eating can cause some anxiety or other uneasy feelings in some people. But we have to remember that ultimately, binge eating is a problem involving food, and we cannot avoid that. And not talking about the food can prevent some issues from being fully addressed. So I'm hoping that hearing about a few of my experiences with eating helps make the concepts that I talk about on this show more real to you and helps you apply what I teach in your own life. With that being said, if you are sensitive to talk about specific foods at this time, then you can always come back to this episode later. I do want to mention, though, that conversations about food are not something that you can ever fully get away from in life. And if you can gradually learn to be comfortable with it and get some practice hearing about food without letting it lead you into harmful behaviors, it will help you to experience your own power to make the food choices that are best for you. And to help you with this, I want to recommend an older podcast episode, which is episode 18, and it's called Don't Let Food and Weight Talk Get You Off Track, and I'll link that episode in the show description. The eating habits that I'm going to talk about today involve cereal and how my relationship with this food has evolved through the years, including through my days of binging and recovering. I wrote a blog post on this topic as well, which I'll also link in the show description. If you've read my book, Brain Over Binge, you know how much trouble I had with cereal during my dieting and binge eating days. I'll jump ahead here to say that now, 18 years after recovery, I really do not eat much cereal at all, and it's never a struggle to avoid it. I'll explain more about this, but when I was a binge eater, I never would have believed that this would be possible, because cereal seemed to control me. It often consumed my thoughts until I ate bowl after bowl of it during binges. I never thought it would be possible to not eat cereal without feeling extremely deprived. But to my surprise, it actually happened quite naturally. I want to share more about how this came about in hopes that it gives you some insight for how you can deal with foods that are currently problematic for you. And I also hope that it just helps you believe that developing a healthier relationship with even your most tempting foods is possible. I definitely do not have a rule against eating cereal, but cereal has mostly lost its appeal. I actually do eat cereal sometimes, but the vast majority of the time, it's not the kind that I used to crave when I was dieting, which was the very sugary kind, which eventually became the kind of cereal that I binged on frequently. Often now when I eat cereal, it's not because I'm truly craving it, it's because it's easy and I'm too overwhelmed or exhausted to prepare anything that takes more time, so I just eat the cereal that I bought for my kids. So now that I've already jumped ahead and told you a little bit about what my relationship with cereal is like today, I want to go way back and say that I did eat sugary cereal often for breakfast as a kid and as a teenager. My mother, like a lot of parents back in the 80s and 90s, used to buy those fun cereal brands like Lucky Charms or Fruit Loops because that's what we liked and that's what was marketed to us as kids. 
But my mom also tried to balance it out with cereal varieties that were viewed as healthier at the time, like, for example, Raisin Bran. And I'm talking about the kind with the sugar-coated raisins, which of course is far from what is typically considered healthy today. As a kid, I ate various types of cereal in normal amounts, and I always stopped after a normal size bowl, and sometimes two if I was really hungry, without really thinking about it much at all. It wasn't until the late 90s when I started restricting my food intake in order to try to control my weight that cereal became a problem. I began labeling sugary cereal as, quote, bad, and I began trying to avoid it. And then, of course, later, I ended up eating more of it than I ever thought possible. At the time I started dieting, the common nutritional advice at the time was that dietary fat was the villain for the most part when it came to food. And because cereal was generally low fat, my reason for thinking it was, quote, bad didn't really have all that much to do with its nutritional content or high sugar. I thought it was bad because of the way I started to feel when I was around it. When I was restricting my food, I suddenly started having strong cravings for cereal, and I started having trouble controlling myself around it. I had trouble stopping once I started eating it. I seemed to want so much cereal, which I had never experienced before, and which scared me. I feared that eating too much of it would give me too many calories and make me gain weight, so I decided to try avoiding it altogether, which made me crave it even more. I shared in Brain Over Binge that my first binge was on sugary cereal, eight bowls of it. In hindsight, it's easy to see exactly what happened and what turned me from a normal cereal eater to someone who could binge on eight bowls of cereal. The short version is that I was starving. I was not eating enough, and because of that, the appeal of the cereal skyrocketed. Calorie deprivation increases the reward value and pleasure of food, especially food that is highly palatable, which usually means that it's high in sugar and carbs and or fat. My strong cravings for cereal made sense from a survival perspective. My brain was just trying to make me eat large amounts of the food that it sensed would help me survive this famine I had created for myself by dieting. Before I was in a calorie deficit, I could pretty much forget that we had cereal in the house. And in my life today, it's basically the same. But when I was in that calorie-deprived state, I would often wake up in the morning and go to bed at night obsessively thinking about the cereal in my parents' pantry. Then, once I binged on cereal once, it quickly became a habit. Eating bowl after bowl of cereal became a regular part of my binges. And when I was having urges to binge and during my binge eating episodes, it felt like my body truly needed that much cereal, even though rationally I knew this was not true. During my years of binging and trying to recover, I came across several sources of information that told me that certain foods were addictive or that certain people were powerless over certain foods. So at various times when I was bulimic, I tried to give up cereal and other similar foods. This never worked for me personally, and it really seemed like such a baffling approach at the time. Like, it didn't seem to make sense to tell someone who feels so out of control around a food to simply never eat that food. I mean, if I couldn't stop my cereal binges, how was I supposed to give up cereal altogether? Maybe that abstaining approach would have worked for me if cereal suddenly no longer existed on Earth. But in my world of living with my parents, and then in a college town with roommates, and then with a boyfriend, and then my husband, there was simply no way to fully escape cereal. And even if I could get it out of the house, I'd still go to the store and buy it for binges. In addition to trying to abstain from cereal, I also tried to learn how to eat it in moderation. And this made more sense to me on the whole, but it also proved to be frustrating. Moderation felt frustrating to me because I actually did learn to eat sugary cereal in moderation sometimes, and I still binged on it at other times. Back then, I did not understand that it was the urges to binge that caused the binges, not the sugary cereal itself. I'll stop here and say that if you're new here and new to the concept of binge urges being the direct cause of binges, you can learn about that in my free ebook, which is called The Brain Over Binge Basics, which explains this and explains how the urges drive the binging and how you can start learning to respond to those urges in a new way so that you can avoid the binges. You can get that free ebook in the show description or on brainoverbinge.com. 
I definitely had more urges to binge around sugary cereal than other foods. I believe that was because I had restricted that food for a while and also because that food was so appealing to my survival drives like I talked about and also because over time I became dependent on the temporary pleasure involved in eating large amounts of that food. It simply became a conditioned response to have urges to binge before, during, or after eating cereal. But like I mentioned, there were some times when I could eat cereal in moderation, especially when other people were around, which means that I was never truly powerless around this food. Then once I learned how to stop acting on my urges to binge in every situation, those urges gradually went away, even when I was eating my former binge foods like sugary cereal. I realized that I had that ability to eat sugary cereal in moderation every time, and eventually that became effortless. So I simply resumed my normal life after recovery, and I ate cereal when I wanted. It was a pretty common breakfast food for me for a while. Although I'd try to mostly buy the kinds that were a little, quote, healthier. I say it that way because that was many years ago, and today there's so much more knowledge and awareness that highly processed cereals are likely not the healthiest thing for us. At the time, I not only ate those healthier kinds, but I also ate the high sugar varieties now and then as well, primarily as a night snack. After binge eating ended and my appetite stabilized, I quickly realized that eating too much sugar in the morning did not make me feel good and led to some blood sugar drops only an hour or two later and increased hunger. What seemed to work for my body at the time was choosing the low sugar varieties if I was eating cereal in the morning and then sometimes having the high sugar treat at night. This was not something that I made into a rule or forced myself into. It just kind of came naturally. But as the months and years went by, I could not ignore the nutrition research that pointed more and more to the idea that sugar and highly processed grains were not something I should be eating so frequently. I mean, I had never been under the impression that cereal was super healthy. It was just something that I liked and I thought was a decent meal or snack. Considering my history with an eating disorder, for a while I wasn't sure how to reconcile the idea that I could absolutely have anything I wanted in moderation with the fact that some foods are, without a doubt, not the best for health. My binge eating days were long gone, but I was and still am firmly set in an anti-diet mentality. I knew dieting caused harm. I knew I never wanted to go down that path again. And I wondered if reducing my cereal intake, and especially my sugary cereal intake, would be considered dieting. The short answer is no, it was not dieting. But it actually took me a little while to truly see it that way. I gradually came to believe that making some healthy changes in a gentle, non-stressful way while making sure I was nourished and eating enough and enjoying my food and not making any harsh rules was not dieting. It's simply replacing foods that are no longer serving you with foods that serve you better. And that never has to mean banning foods completely. I started exploring other breakfast options that included more protein and fats. And carbs too, I definitely did not stop eating carbs. Fast forward to today, I cannot even remember the last time that I ate the types of sugary cereal that I used to binge on. I sometimes eat the types of cereal that are a little more natural, such as granola, still typically as a night snack. I may eat it for a couple of nights and then forget I have it, and then my kids will eat it before I can have any more or I simply won't want it. Although this all really seemed to happen naturally, I've taken some time to think about what helped me the most in learning to feel and be in control around cereal. And I came up with five things that I'm going to share to end this show. I want you to think about these five things in relation to any food that you're currently struggling with or that you would like to develop a healthier relationship with. Number one is, I know I can have the cereal if I want it. I can absolutely go buy a box of cereal right now, even a very sugary kind, and have a bowl of it and enjoy it. No big deal. It's not forbidden in my mind. Pleasure for the sake of pleasure in moderation is not a bad thing. It's fun, it's delicious, and we all have to find that balance in our own lives between pleasure and focusing on our health. I simply prefer other desserts and sweets over sugary cereal at this point in my life. Number two, I'm no longer calorie restricted. Because of this, sugar does not hold as strong of an appeal as it did when I was starving, and it was so attractive to my survival instincts. It's amazing what eating enough will do to help with your cravings. Number three, my decision to reduce my cereal intake came gradually and naturally. 
My slow shift away from cereal came partially from nutritional information that I read, but also from my own insights about how the cereal was making me feel. When I was reducing it, I never felt like I was fighting against myself or holding myself back from something I truly wanted. Also, what's important is that the changes came when I was ready, not because some diet plan told me that's what I should do. Number four, I do not believe I'm powerless against cereal or any other food. There's no more fear around eating cereal. I know I can stop after a reasonable amount. Conversely, there's also no fear that not eating it will lead me to crave it more. That's different from when I tried to give up cereal during my dieting and binge eating years because that was out of a sense of fear, because I felt so out of control. Number five is simply that I'm older, and some of my childhood foods have lost their appeal. There's definitely a reason that sugary cereal is heavily marketed to kids. It's okay to walk away from childhood foods that are not benefiting you in adulthood. This is not dieting. It's part of growing up and learning to take care of yourself in better ways. Now, with all of this being said, I do not want to give the impression that my eating is perfectly healthy. Like, for example, I did not eat any sugary cereal today, but my daughter and I shared a big piece of chocolate and Oreo cheesecake at a bookstore. And that's just one example. There are so many other pleasurable foods that I still choose to eat because they're delicious. Like I mentioned, everyone has to find that balance for themselves. And when you step away from binge eating, you can learn to make genuine choices about how to nourish yourself and enjoy delicious food. Thank you so much for listening today. I hope you're able to use some of these insights in your own journey to freedom from binge eating. If you want more help as you discover a way of eating that works for you, you can go to brainoverbinge.com forward slash subscribe to learn about options for extra guidance. You can get my extensive self-paced course, and you can also sign up for highly supportive and personalized coaching from Brain Over Binge Coach Julie in either a one-on-one setting or in the group. You can find all of that information in the show description as well. As always, I want to encourage you and remind you that you have the power to change your brain and live a binge-free life. The Brain Over Binge podcast is produced and recorded by Brain Over Binge Recovery Coaching, LLC. All work is copyrighted by Brain Over Binge Recovery Coaching, LLC, and all rights are reserved. As a disclaimer, the hosts of the Brain Over Binge podcast are not professional counselors or licensed healthcare providers, and this podcast is not a substitute for medical advice or any form of professional therapy. Eating disorders can have serious health consequences, and you are strongly advised to seek medical attention for matters relating to your health. Please get help when you need it, and good luck on your journey. Need more help? You can find all of our current and upcoming options for support at brainoverbinge.com.